We from the Durham Union Society are here today to tell you that there are some objective goods. There are some truths that are worth fighting for. There are some truths that are worth dying for. There are some truths that will protect your children and protect your family. We believe that you created your children. You are forced, therefore, to protect them. We think it's okay to value your children's lives above your own, and we'll explain all of that in three main points. First, I'm going to talk about moral agency. Second, I'm going to explain why, to gain peace, we must prepare for war. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about what happens if we let only one country have an army while the rest of us sleep. Before that, I've got a lot of rebuttal. The proposition seems to have made a mistake in this debate, and that they seem to be telling us that our burden is to defend why every war is a good war. We say that the only burden placed on the opposition is to show why in one scenario war can be of benefit because otherwise we would sometimes go to war as is the status quo, right? We also think there's a huge inconsistency that I will return to later between first prop's assertion that self-defense is okay when someone attacks you personally, but at the same time you shouldn't organize so that you have a larger self-defense force that can protect you as a group that may be more efficient at protecting you, right? And then we have my toddler example. The importance here is that we are saving more lives through a single act. It's not about whether we value the evil life that we kill, it's that we value the innocent lives that we save by killing that one evil man. That's the moral calculus, that's what we do. Now in terms of the second half of proposition, their entire case was predicated on the idea that we go to war. From the second half of the opposition, we're going to tell you that war often comes to us. We don't think that the US didn't, well, like we think that the Taliban attack, and Al-Qaeda attacked the US prior to the US attacking them. We don't buy the idea that there is always no harm that starts these scenarios and we choose it purely ideologically. We also heard a bit about crazy Israelis, which obviously I won't comment on, so I'll talk about Iran. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we just don't buy that if Iran is allowed to have weapons and Israel isn't, that suddenly Iran isn't going to try and wipe them into the sea like Iran says that they would like to. And we think that's really important in this debate. And then finally, what we heard from them is that oppressive regimes are better than war. What we would say is some oppressive regimes are better than war, others aren't. That's why we don't always go to war. Like, we think you can make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So, my first point. Let's unpack this idea of moral agency and we never truly know what the truth is. We think that it is always wrong, and always will be wrong, to say that we will kill everyone with black hair because they have black hair. We just don't buy the idea that that will ever be morally acceptable. We also think in many cases, this is a situation in which a relatively small number of empowered individuals are committing this atrocity on a larger group of less empowered individuals. This brings me back to my toddler example. Because of the distinction in empowerment, in the example I gave being a full-fledged adult versus being a child, that actor has greater power over the children. But while at the same time, we as another adult can take them out and prevent that atrocity from occurring. Like, we also think that there's an inconsistency in that argument here. Because we make moral decisions all the time in the form of a police force. Like, we accept that within our own state borders, if somebody is committing an atrocity, we are allowed to stop them and prevent them as sanctioned by the state. We think that the same thing has to be true if somebody from outside our borders is committing similar atrocities within our state. Like, we don't think it's logically consistent to say that atrocities within our state should only be prevented if they're done by our citizens. We think it's true either way. Yeah, I'll teach you for right now. By the logic you just used in your speech earlier, if you kill one innocent person to save hundreds of evil people, that would also be okay. <laughs> you know what? We say that oftentimes this unfortunately happens. 
Like, but we just don't buy, according to your logic, that you absolutely know good and evil in these cases. Like, we're prepared to admit that this doesn't always occur. What we do know, though, is that you can still do a calculus in terms of number of lives saved. And we know that we're in favor of more and more lives in these instances. Right, so here's where the self-defense point comes in and why it's a game piece we must prepare for war. They said it's okay that if someone comes up to me with a knife and tries to stab me, I should by myself and as an individual try and fend them off. We think that human groupings quite naturally form self-defensive units are based on the idea that I am less likely to die if me and Ben take on the one man who is attacking us with a knife. Okay. Within an army, it's just an extension of this principle outwards. So, if you have an entire army marching towards your border, and every man, woman, and child in your country says, well, I'm gonna fight them, but I'm gonna do it individually, and only when they actually attack me personally. Like, we just don't buy that you're gonna be successful in defending off that army. Okay. As opposed to, if you actually form together, organize, and stand at your border, we think that's how you get peace, and we do buy what came out of first or first opposition, which was that that also can stop them invading just because you know you have your army there, so it will be less easy to take you down from all sides, right? And we think that this is where we get to the escalation uh, and desperation. Like, we just don't buy into the idea that many of the individuals that we've mentioned are going to say, well, the US is a fundamentally peaceful nation. They may be more successful, but they're fundamentally peaceful. So we're never going to have a problem that they're not part of the Islamic Caliphate ever again. Like, that's suddenly okay now, that they're not part of our giant Islamic state around the world, simply because they're all pacifists. So we don't think that you can universalize that principle to the same extent. We think because of that, you have to be prepared to fight for and defend your own country. Because even if your entire country becomes a pacifistic state, there are still always others out there who won't be bound by the same logic as they told us, who will be religious extremists who will not abide by these same rules. And because we resent the implication that when attacked we should not defend, we urge you to oppose. <laughs>